Hey, Casey, can you tell me if you can hear me? Or how well you can hear me? Okay, perfect. All right, guys, so I'm gonna give it just a few minutes. I just wanted to get on here and make sure that um, I had the sound checked and that it was gonna work right for us because I wanted to make sure you could hear me through the whole thing because this is probably gonna be a long one and it should be really, really fun. I'm really looking forward to it. Okay, good, oh, good, I'm so glad. Okay, so before we get started, I know it's a little early at the beginning of this video, um, but just to let you all know, the way I have this camera set up, I can't see your questions. Um, so I'll stop kind of periodically and like go back through and look at your questions, but I'm not going to be able to see them as I'm going, um, just because the way I had to set this up tonight to make it work, but that's okay. We'll, we'll get it together. Um, and also, I do want to say here at the beginning, um, just kind of a content warning. There won't be any foul language in this at all, um, but there's a lot of criminal content. These lives that we're going to be doing, you know, tonight's our first night of this series that we're going to do. Um, this is not going to be appropriate for children. I mean, you know, obviously, if you're parents, use your own discretion raise your kids the way you want to. Not my job to tell you that. <laughs> but I know I personally probably wouldn't want um, little kids, if they were mine, to hear some of this stuff. Teenagers maybe, but you know, um, just be aware there, there's gonna be some pretty graphic points. Um, you know, I might explain some things or tell you about things that have happened that might kind of turn your stomach a little bit. You might not want to hear about it. Um, so just a fair warning telling you now, getting it out of the way. This may not be the the most appetizing conversation, <laughs> but so um, before we get started with Ed Kemper, I know a lot of people are going to be painting along with me. So I am actually, before I did my tracing on here, before I do the tracing, I'm going to do my background color because I want it to be green, like a darker on the outside, but I want it to kind of transition into a lighter on the inside. So I'm going to um, put those all together and try to blend them while the paint is still wet. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a lot easier to blend them that way. Okay. I'm going to give just a couple more minutes, guys. <clears throat> I can't see the time, so I'm not sure how close we are to nine or if it is nine. I know that some people are going to be here for the painting. Some people are going to be here for the story. Um, either way, <laughs> thanks for joining us. I'm glad to have you. And if anyone is in our painters group, our door hanger group, if you wouldn't care to share this in there, a lot of people um, will join once they know that I'm live. But I forgot to share it. It was my fault. Okay. All right, so let's get started with painting and we'll go ahead and let's talk about Ed. All right, so Ed Kemper, also known as the co-ed killer or sometimes the co-ed butcher. Um, we're gonna call him the co-ed killer tonight. <laughs> uh, he was born California in 1948 and he was a big baby. He was 13 pounds already ahead of his peers. And if you know anything about Ed Kemper, you know that he grows up to be a very large man. 
So he's always been large, always been ahead of the others that were his same age. So he had two sisters. He had one older sister and one younger sister, which doesn't sound significant right now, but it will make it will be later. And his dad was actually a veteran. He was in the military. And when he came back from being in the military, he was in World War II. He took a job as an electrician. He didn't make a whole lot of money, but, you know, he did what he could to provide for his family, which, of course, you know, that's always good. But apparently it wasn't good enough for his mom. She kind of always ragged on him and she just always put the dad down. So... That's a whole different story. Anyways, so whenever Ed Kemper was younger, he was always, like, always antisocial. Like, he would just do things that made him somebody that other kids didn't want to socialize with. For example, he was always really cruel to animals. Um, so there's a story about when he was 10 years old, uh, he took their family cat and he literally buried it alive. Like, just buried it alive. But then he dug it back up after the cat was dead so that he could dismember it, cut its head off, cut the cat's head off, and put the head on the spike. And that's just, like, we're talking 10 years old. 10, 10 years old and he's already doing this stuff like it's just it's just crazy to me I mean I just me at 10 I'm like playing with Barbies you know I'm interested in normal kid stuff but this guy at 10 he's like yeah let's just go ahead and kill a cat no big deal I'm just gonna you know decapitate it and put its head on this stick this is gonna be fine Ugh, just blows my mind anyway so then if that wasn't enough then when he's 13 they get another family cat. And I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. You're like, why did they even get a second cat? Like after, like you murder one cat, let's not get another one. Let's just stick with, you know, stick with no pets. But it actually seems that he really enjoyed the fact that he got away with what he did to the first cat. His like, that he never told them that he did it. So they didn't really know that he was the one that killed the first cat. They just knew that the cat was gone. Um, so they get another cat, and um, so he's 13, but he doesn't like this cat. He doesn't like this cat because apparently this cat likes his littlest sister better than him. So he decides, uh, he decides that he's going to kill it, <clears throat> but then he dismembered it and kept the pieces of this cat in his closet until his mom finally found them and made him get rid of them. I just like, I wish I had been a fly on the wall for that conversation. Can you just imagine how that went? Like, yeah, I just found these, uh, these cat parts in your closet. You want to like, let's go ahead and get rid of those. Like, <laughs> can you just imagine what that conversation was? But so she has him get rid of, the cat pieces obviously but so aside from his cruelty to animals he also liked to play really weird games with his sisters and one of them was called um they called it gas chamber where he would have them like turn on the lights of a room that he's in and he would just writhe around in pain like he was being gassed and another one was called electric chair which i mean you can kind of put this together he would like sit in a chair and act like he was being electrocuted and just pretend that he's in just unbearable pain. Just so weird. Like I can't imagine like going to the playground and being like, hey, I really want to make some new friends. Let's play this new game that I, that I play a lot with my sisters. It's so fun. You all are going to love it. Like, can you imagine how hard it was for him to make friends? But I mean, that's really bad. But the thing is, is that like, his mom was so cruel to him and she put him down so much. So he didn't really know how to socialize with people. But anyway, so when he was, 
think he was nine in 1957, his parents did end up getting a divorce. And that was really hard on him. He was actually really close to his dad. So keep in mind that the cat incidents <laughs> were actually post-divorce. Um, I'm not sure if that would be like related or not, but it was just kind of ironic that um, he was really close with his dad and then after they got divorced is when he really started being so cruel to animals. But so his parents divorced in 1957 and he actually had to stay with his mom and they stayed in Montana. And this was really bad for him. I'm sorry, let me take a drink. Probably going to get <laughs> a little bit of a sore throat after talking so much tonight, but this is going to be so worth it. <laughs> okay, so he's staying with his mom in Montana and she's just so cruel to him because she is like, to her, she, I mean, she's had a hard life and he even admits at one point that she had a hard life, but he is like a reminder of everything that was wrong with her life because he reminds her of his dad and she just can't stand him obviously after everything that's happened and so she really tells him things all the time like oh you're just like your dad or she makes fun of him for his size because by the time he's 15 he's six foot four or five like 15 and she always makes fun of him about that but she also was really I, I think she was afraid of him she was really afraid of what he was going to do to his sisters so she made him sleep in their basement of their house and like the worst part about this is that not only did he have to sleep there but it was like to get to the basement there was like a trap door that was underneath their kitchen table that's how you got to the basement there was no other way in or out so if you can imagine being a kid so like if he's 10 years old and he says in one of his interviews that his sisters went upstairs to go to bed and he got sent downstairs like to the basement to go to bed and he just always felt like what did i do wrong like he felt like he was such a bad kid and it was so dark in this basement so he would as soon as he would get down there, he would like run as fast as he could across the basement to get to the one single light bulb that was there so that he could turn some lights on. But anyway, so his mother, mother was just horrible to him. And he also like just had a habit of just doing destructive things. So he was just like tearing things up, but he would take his sister's dolls and like tear the head and hands off of them, the head and hands. Yeah. Off of them. And in one interview, he's talking about how he had this, like, I think he said it was a little cap gun or something, and it was, like, his favorite toy that he had. And his older sister, who he apparently just had a really terrible relationship with, um, she just could not stand that he had this cap gun. And he's, according to him, it's because she was just jealous that he had something that made him happy. So she ended up breaking it, and I can't remember if it was, like, an accident or if it was intentional. But she ended up breaking it, so he went and got her Barbie doll, and he said that it was, like, the nicest doll that she had, and he, like, he did something to it. I can't remember if he broke, like, a, a arm or something. Anyway, he broke it, and he was like, see, your toy is broken, now mine is. And, like, honestly, that makes it, like, I get it. If you're a kid, you know, okay, sure, that's something that you would do. But as an adult, and when you're hearing him give this interview... It's like he's almost saying, like, see, this is why I had to do these things. It's just, like, he almost gives, he he seems to think that that's a good reason for being the kind of person that he is. But anyway, so his mother, she never gave him any kind of affection. She actually said that she was afraid that if she loved on him or doted on him at all, that he would turn gay. <laughs> so she wouldn't give him any kind of attention. But guys, let's take a break real quick because I'm going to blow dry this so that I can move on to the next step. If I can get it on. Sorry, this is probably a little bit loud. Can you hear me over the blow dryer? If someone can let me know, I'll keep talking.
so so his mother doesn't give him any affection. He's not like used to having any kind of relationships with just people in general because the only chance he has for like a good relationship, especially with women, is through his mom and of course she's not giving him that attention. So he doesn't have any good relationship with women, doesn't know how to have one. But whenever he's 14, you know, I said he had a really good relationship with his dad. He runs away because he wants to be with his dad. His dad still lives in California. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I just saw your responses. Um, so his dad still lives in California. So at 14, he runs away in, I think it was 1962 or 63. I can't remember. To be with his dad. And when he gets there, his dad is, he's remarried. And he has a stepson. And some of the places that I saw this said that he actually had another son um, with his second wife. But I'm not sure if he was born yet, so I'll have to double check on that. But anyway, so he's not really very welcome there. And one um, incident that happened was he really just creeped out his stepmom, like... She was really uncomfortable with him. He would, like, one day she said that he was, like, going around and shutting all the blinds and the windows and everything and making the house really dark. And it was just the two of them there. And it just creeped her out so badly. And luckily, I think it was her older son that came home at that moment. And then they had him leave. So, um, Ed's dad has him go live with his paternal grandparents and he's miserable about this. Like, he does not want to go live with them at all. His He thinks that his grandmother is really similar to his mom in that she just, how did he say it, demasculates him and his grandfather. Um, one thing that he said about her was that she thought she had bigger balls than any man that she could ever know. Um so he really despises her. He just doesn't like her. And it's it seems like he just relates almost every woman to his mother. Because he has such a terrible relationship with her. But, um, so one day he's there with his grandmother. His grandfather has gone to the store. I don't know if it was like the grocery or whatever. I don't know. But anyway, so he's talking to his grandma. And they're having an argument because she has asked him to please stop killing the birds on their farm. If you remember, he's got this problem with being cruel to animals. So, so she asked him to stop being so, like stop killing the birds, you know, just quit being so cruel. And he loses it. They have this all out brawl, turns into a huge argument. And so they're having this really heated argument in the kitchen and he just gets so mad, he just storms out. He storms out of the kitchen. And he goes to find his grandfather's shotgun. He comes back into the kitchen and just shoots his grandmother right in the back of the head. And he kills her instantly. Well, then once her body falls, he shoots her twice in the back. And some sources say that he, even after she was already dead, he just started stabbing her. Like, he was just so enraged. Like, he just couldn't stop. This, oh my gosh, that's just so crazy. Like, I just can't imagine, like, know it like being related to somebody like your grandmother like someone's taking care of you and just getting that mad about something so small especially when you're clearly doing something wrong but anyway so then his grandfather comes home and he goes out to the driveway and just shoots him right there like just shoots him and when he's asked later about why did you do this he says that the reason he killed his grandmother was because he wanted to, to know what it felt like. But the reason that he killed his grandfather was because he didn't want him to have to see his wife murdered. Like, it was just really weird because why, like, this, like, in his mind, it's almost like doing a kindness for his grandfather. Like, it, I don't know. Really, really, really strange. But anyway, so after he does this, he doesn't really know what to do. He's like, okay, so now I've done this. Where do I go? What do I do? And for some reason, of all the people he could think of, he decides to call his mom. He tells his mom what he did. And she's like, you need to call the police and tell them what you did. So he does. And he just sits there on the porch of his grandparents' house and just waits for the police to get there. They put him in handcuffs. He, like, openly admits that he did it. He's got no problem with that. 
And, you know, he even tells them why. It's, it's like, it's almost like he's not even ashamed of it. But keep in mind, he's like 15 at this point. 15. So he goes through a court trial. I mean, it just blows my mind. But he goes through a court trial. And obviously, like, he's already said that he definitely did do it. But they kind of, like, rule him like crazy. They say that he's apparently schizophrenic. So they send him to a Tascadero State Hospital. And once he gets there, he's, like, a model prisoner. He's, like, amazing. Everybody likes him. The psychiatrists there don't agree, even, with the diagnosis that he was given from the court psychiatrist. They're saying that they were totally wrong, that... Um, if anything, the most he has is a passive aggressive personality disorder. And that's like it. Like they think he's totally normal and he's so smart. I think when he first gets there at 15 years old, they say that his IQ was like 136. But when he turns, I think he's 17 or 18 and he gets tested again and by that time, now his IQ is like a 145. He's just so, so smart. But because he's such a good model inmate, they start having him administer a psychiatric test to the other inmates. Because he's, like, he's so nice. Like, nobody's worried about him. He's, like, just a really good kid. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and trace... The, my stencil now. I wanted to get my background done first and then once I trace my stencil I color all of this in white so that I can paint my color over it. Okay so as he's doing these psychiatric tests for all these other patients he actually is even creating other tests like he's just he's so smart and he's helping the psychiatrist so much like one of the tests that he developed I think was like um Oh, what was it? Oh, I can't, no, I can't remember. It'll come to me as soon as I get done talking here. But he was just so helpful to them. They absolutely loved being around him. They said he was such a hard worker. And seriously, they did not understand how this could possibly have been the case, that he had done this. So he's there through 1969 on his birthday, which is December 18th. He's there all the way through his birthday when he turns 21. And he actually gets released at 21 on parole. And he decides, against medical advice, to go back and live with his mother. Now, the psychiatrist that he did see when he was in the hospital had made it very clear to him that they really think that she is or was the root of his problems. Because he just had so many issues with her. She was so abusive to him emotionally and they really did not want to see him go back to be with her but I mean he's 21 he's been imprisoned since he was 15 he's got nothing he doesn't have money he doesn't have his own place he's got nowhere else to go he doesn't really have a choice and he knows he can't stay with his dad obviously so he goes back to live with his mom and by this time she's now living in California and it's just like all over again. Everything starts all over again. She's just so cruel to him and everything. But he's trying, or we think, he's trying to get his life on track. He gets enrolled into a community college. And um, he has a couple of little jobs here and there, you know. Um, but he's doing pretty good. He did want to be a police officer, but he got turned away. Because he was so big. By this point in his life, he's 21, he's now six foot nine. And they say he's between like 250 and 300 pounds, just a big guy. But even though he didn't make it into the police force, he still ends up being friends with a lot of the police officers. And they all go to this bar. Um, it's called the jury room. And it's basically where like just a whole bunch of the police officers in the area go to hang out and so, and they get to know him. They get to know him really well, and they really like him. He's such a great guy. And they start calling him Big Ed. And so they'll go in there, and they'll, like, just tell him about, you know, whatever happened during their day. And they're, like, telling him about cases and stuff because, I mean, it's Big Ed, right? He's no big deal. You know, we love him. But then um, <laughs> he ends up getting a job with the Division of Highway. 
but which is great. Like it's it's really good for him. That he's able to get a job, but at the same time, he's still having this just like grossly unhealthy and toxic relationship with his mother. Um, let me read you a quote. Actually, he says. My mother and I started right in on horrendous battles, just horrible battles, violent and vicious. I've never been in such a vicious verbal battle with anyone. It would go to fist with a man, but this was my mother, and I couldn't stand the thought of my mother and I doing these things. She insisted on it, and just over stupid things. I remember one roof razor was over whether I should have my teeth cleaned. Like, just crazy stupid stuff like that. Like, just arguing over the dumbest stuff. Um, so eventually with his job, with the highway, the division of highway, he ends up saving enough money that he is able to move in with a friend. Um, I don't know who that friend was. I couldn't find that information, but I'm not sure that it's relevant. So he moves in with his friend and he finally gets what he thinks is going to be a break from his mom. He's so excited to not have to be around her all the time, <laughs> but she makes sure that that doesn't last very long because she ends up just going over to his house all the time. She's always, always there. She won't leave him alone. Or she'll, like, call him on the phone just incessantly. Just constantly around. And, I mean, no, you're like a 21-year-old guy. The last thing you want when you're living on your own is for your mom just to, like, drop by randomly. But, yeah. Anyway, it's neither here nor there. So he never really gets time away from her. But in addition to all of that, he is also struggling financially. I mean, he's got a job, but it's, you know, he's not making a ton of money off of it. So he sometimes he has to go back and stay with her. Like he doesn't have anywhere else to go. So he'll go home and stay with her for a while. So it's almost like he feels obligated to maintain a relationship with her because he's going to need help at some point because he's so hard up for money. But, you know, things aren't always bad. He actually does get engaged at one point to, um, I, th I think it was, my husband found a source that said it was a, a really young girl, but I saw somewhere that it was a college student. I guess it could have been both. Um, maybe she was young and a college student, but anyway. Um, and it, it's almost not really important, but I think it was just at least he had a little bit of good in his life. But honestly, they're going to break it off whenever he goes to jail the second time anyway. But, um... So around this time, he has a motorcycle. As and he's driving one day on his motorcycle, and he gets hit by a car, and he ends up getting a settlement from that um, because he was really badly injured. I mean, he he survived obviously, but he was still injured. So I think it was like a fifteen thousand dollars settlement, which in like today's money was like I think it was like ninety thousand dollars. But so he used that money to buy a 69 Ford Galaxy. And it was yellow and it had a black top. And that's what we're going to be painting today. That's what's on their, our door hanger here. And that's going to be the vehicle that he commits most of his crimes in. Um, but so now he's got a car. And of course, you know, he already works for the division of the highway. So he's just going up and down the highway. And he's noticing that there are so many women that are hitchhiking. Like, so many on this highway. And, like, he's already, you know, not knowing how to interact with women. But now he is, like, starting to pick them up because they're hitchhiking. So he'll pick them up and he'll give them a ride. And he's gradually storing things in his car, like handcuffs and, um, like, little baggies, knives, blankets. Like, just, you know, things you might need if you were going to commit a terrible crime. So he's gradually just storing those things in his car. And he says that he actually picked up at least 150 women and released them pe peacefully. Like, didn't do anything to them. Just picked them up, took them where they wanted to go, and that was it. Before he started giving in to his desire to commit a crime. Um, and actually, he, he really explains it more like a sexual desire and you'll understand why shortly <laughs> um so anyway so this is in 72 that this happens by april of 73 he has killed eight people 
and we're gonna talk about each one of those. So <laughs> if you're if you're queasy, this would be a good time to bail out because we're gonna get into it. All right, so May 7th, 1972, he's in Berkeley, California, and he picks up two 18-year-olds. Mary Ann Pesci, I think it is, I think that's how you pronounce it, and Anita Mary Lucheza. And he gets them in the car, and you know, like, they're going somewhere, like, close by. I think it was, maybe it was like an hour away or something like that. But, you know, gets them in the car, and at first, they're like, totally fine. But then he drives them to a secluded area, and he ends up handcuffing Mary Ann, and then forces Anita into the trunk. Then he comes back to Mary Ann, and she fights him hard. Like, she is not going to let him do anything to her. She's trying so hard to fight him. And he tries to suffocate her with a bag, but it, it doesn't work because she's fighting so hard. She, like, bites through the bag. So he ends up stabbing her multiple times um, and kills her, obviously. And then he goes back for... Anita, who is in the trunk, um, and he ends up stabbing and strangling her as well. But here's the interesting part. This is just, this is so crazy to me. So while he is stabbing Marianne, he actually like brushed his arm accidentally, or like while he's attacking her, he has, he wasn't stabbing her yet, but while he's attacking her, he accidentally brushes his arm against her breast and he's like horrified that he did this. And he's like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Like, my bad. Like, you're literally attacking this woman. And now you're like, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to barely graze your breast. Like, that is just insane to me. But when he's trying to stab her, he says, like, I thought it would be like in the movies. Like, I would stab her once and she would go down. And it wasn't. Of course it's not. Like, <laughs> so he realizes that he has to stab her like a lot to kill her but you're like why don't you just stab her in the heart you know that'll kill her right away but he says that he just could not stab her in the heart because he didn't he just couldn't bring himself to um destroy her breast like that is just so creepy to me like it oh i just can't even understand sorry i realized i didn't trace the other half of his mustache <clears throat> so anyway he was really awkward and embarrassed about it, but so when he goes to get Anita out of the trunk, he's like covered in blood because Marianne has been fighting him like crazy. And of course, he doesn't want Anita to panic and like try to get away. So he's just like, hey, your friend got smart with me. So I uh, hit her in the nose and she was bleeding and I think she ran off like you might want to go check on her. So... She gets out of the trunk to go do that, and that's when he stabs her, and he ends up slitting her throat, and, oh my gosh, it's just so gruesome. But, so then he, um, gets their bodies in the trunk, and he starts to drive away. Now, like, all of that's crazy, but listen to this. So, he's done this, he's driving down the highway, and he has two dead bodies in his trunk, and gets pulled over by a police officer because he has a tail light out. And the officer, of course, like isn't gonna know right away that there's a dead body in the trunk, but he was so close to getting caught. Like it was, he easily could have gotten caught right then, but he didn't. They, you know, they talk to him about the tail light and then move on, that's it. So he goes back to his apartment and he, okay, this is where it gets graphic, guys. I'm sorry. He takes the corpses inside of his apartment and he photographs them. He also has sexual intercourse with them. And then he just dismembers the body and decapitates them. He puts the body parts in bags, which he's going to, you know, that's how he's going to dispose of them later. But he keeps the heads and he ends up using them for oral sex. Like, oh my gosh, that's just so, that's so crazy. <sighs> so after he's <laughs> um, 
should I say satisfied <laughs> after he's done? I'm sorry, this is not funny, but this is just so unsettling. After he's done with their bodies, you no, know, they're all bagged in pieces. He takes them and disposes of them just in different locations. Um, I think it was like on near a mountain or something. I'm sorry, I don't remember. But their bodies were never found. The only thing that was found was Marianne's head. So that was his, um, well, aside from his grandparents, that was his first two murders. So then, September 14th, 1972, he picks up 15-year-old, is it Eiko Ku? I think that's how you pronounce her name. And she was a ballet dancer, and she was actually trying to get a ride to her dance class. She had missed the bus. And when she gets in his car, he immediately pulls a gun on her. But he tells her that he's not going to shoot her that he actually plans to kill himself, but he wants her to be there for it. And, I mean, that's already unsettling, but that's kind of, like, how he keeps her calm because she's thinking, well, he's not going to hurt me. He's just, he wants to hurt himself. Um, so, again, he drives her to a secluded area, and he accidentally locks himself out of the car, Okay. The gun is inside the car, she is inside the car, and he locks himself out. And he has manipulated her so much that she actually unlocks the car and lets him back in. She could have completely gotten away. Like, she could have just driven off. Or she had the gun. She could have killed him. But she trusted, he said that he, like, developed trust with her. So... After he gets back in, he, you know, she fights with him a little bit, but he ends up choking her, raping her after he, after she's, after he kills her, he rapes her body. And same thing like he did before. He puts her body in the trunk like the other girls. And this time on his way home to his apartment, he stops at a bar, like a, a nearby bar to get a drink like just you know so casual like it's just any other day yeah I just killed somebody I'm gonna stop and get you know whiskey and coke or whatever his drink was like just no big deal that just blows my mind but once he comes back out to the car he opens the trunk to look at her body again like he's in the parking lot of this bar there there's so many chances that he could have gotten caught and didn't it just is, it blows my mind how many times that he should have been caught. But anyway, so he just wanted to kind of revel in his work, I guess. And again, takes her back to his apartment. Kind of does the same thing. You know, he photographs her dead body. Has sexual intercourse with it. Again, dismembers her. Puts all of her body parts in a bag. The same thing, you know, has... Forces oral sex on her decapitated head. Again, this is just his M.O., you know. Um, but her body was never found. It's never been found. Which, can you just imagine? Like, it's just heartbreaking to think of her parents because, I mean, she's 15 and they never got to bury her properly or really say their goodbyes. It's just heartbreaking. Um... So then, January 7th, 1973, he picks up Cindy Shaw. She's 18 years old. Again, takes her to a secluded area. And this time, he shoots her fatally and drives her body back to his mother's house. That's where he was staying at the time. And he hides her in his closet until his mother leaves the next morning for work. Once she's gone, he gets up, and um, some sources say that he dismembered her in his mother's shower or bathtub, but he ended up taking the bullet out where he fatally shot her. He takes the bullet out, and, you know, again, same MO, sexual intercourse, dismembers her completely, but this time, whenever he decapitates her, he takes the head... Keeps the head. 
and buries it in his mother's garden and has the head facing towards his mother's bedroom window. And he says the reason he does this is because his mom always wanted people to look up to her. Oh, gosh, this blows my mind. Mm. So, anyways. <clears throat> oh, you know what I forgot to tell you? Let me go back because I just realized I forgot to tell you something. Whenever he killed Ekuku, Ekoku, I'm sorry, and he had her dismembered head, he went to see his appointed psychiatrist that day with her head in a bag in his car. And this was the day, once he got there, the psychiatrist that he was meeting with was like, oh, he is totally better. He's so much better. He really doesn't need any more therapy. Like, I really think that he's so rehabilitated that we should have his record, his juvenile record expunged. And, and this is what, let me just read you this quote of what his, this psychiatrist said on the day that Ed Kemper goes to see him with Ekoku's head in a bag in his car. This is what he said. If I were to see this patient without having any history available or getting any history from him, I would think we're dealing with a very well-adjusted young man who has initiative, intelligence, and who is free of any psychiatric illnesses. It's my opinion that he has made a very excellent response to the years of treatment and rehabilitation, and I would see no psychiatric reason to consider him to be a danger to himself or to any member of society. And since it may allow him more freedom as an adult to develop his potential, I would consider it reasonable to have his permanent expunction of his juvenile records. And they did it. They completely expunged his records. And he's got a head in his car. It, it just, it goes to show you just how manipulative this guy is. Like how he's got everyone totally convinced of the kind of person that he is. <sighs> okay, so let's move forward. All right, so February 5th, 1973, he again picks up two girls. He picks up Rosalind Thorpe. I think that she's 23. There's a lot of conflicting resources on this, though. Like, some sources say she was younger. Some say she was older. I don't... I, I think she was in the 23-year-old range. And he also picks up 20-year-old Allison Liu. Again, the age is, like... A lot of discrepancies depending on where you're looking. Um, so he, at this point, the media, the college, everything, they are on high alert. Like they know there's a killer in the area. Um, so they have told all of their students, like, don't get into the car with anyone who doesn't have a university sticker on their car. So here's the crazy part about this is that his mom actually worked for the university. So he does have a university sticker on his car. He absolutely does. So when he stops, like they think that he's okay to get in the car with, cause that's what the media has told them, but he's definitely not obviously. So anyway, so he stops to pick up Rosalind and Allison. Rosalind kind of gets in without hesitating. Like she, they need a ride and she's going to take a ride. But Allison is really hesitant. She's not crazy about the idea. And Rosalind kind of convinces her to go ahead and get in. And he actually shoots them immediately. As soon as they're both in the car, even while he's on campus of the college, he shoots them both. When he's driving out of the college campus, there's a security guard sitting there. And at this point, he has covered both of the bodies up with a blanket. And he's like, oh yeah, I found these two girls. They're really drunk and passed out. So I'm going to take them home. And again, he look how close he was to getting caught. Like if somebody just would have paid a little bit more attention, he would have gotten caught. But they didn't. So. so he ends up taking them again back to his mother's house where he's still living. Beheads them in his car. He opens up the trunk of his car 
while he's just outside in the driveway and beheads them right there. And actually one source said that this all happened after a particularly bad argument with his mother. It was like he just needed to let this rage out. Um, so beheads them right there in the driveway. And again, he takes her bodies inside, but he leaves the heads in the car. Um, has sexual intercourse with their corpses, dismembers them, again removes the bullets, because he's trying to make sure that, like, you can't trace him. He wants to make sure they're not going to find him. Um, and let me read you this quote, because I, I don't think this is so creepy. He was asked, after he was caught, he was asked why he chose to decapitate them, because, I mean, that's just, like, the worst thing you can do to a human is just got their head oh, it's so crazy so this is what he says in response to that question the head trip fantasies were a bit like a trophy you know the head is where everything is at the brain eyes mouth that's the person i remember being told as a kid you cut off the head and the body dies the body is nothing after the head is cut off well that's not quite true there's a lot left in the girl's body without the head Oh my god, doesn't that just like turn your stomach? It just kind of makes you sick to think about. It just... Oh. So after that happens, um, it's about mm, a little better than two months later. April 20th, 1973. His mother's been out to a party that night. And he stayed home. She comes home. It's kind of late. And he goes into her bedroom and... Like, she asks if he wants to talk or something, and he's like, no, just good night, you know. Well, after she falls asleep, he goes back in, and he bludgeons her with a, I think it's a claw hammer, and then he slits her throat. Just like he's done with everybody else, he then decapitates her and uses her head for oral sex. But it, it, like, it doesn't stop there. And this just shows you how much he cannot stand his mother, how much he despises this woman. Then he takes her head and uses it as a dartboard. And he spends hours, like hours, just screaming at her decapitated head. Because he's just so angry. He's just so angry at her. And then, after all that, he ends up bashing her face completely in. And, oh my gosh, it just it is so great. I just don't understand how you could do that to someone. And, you know, later on, he's being interviewed. I just remember this. Later on in an interview, um, they were like, but how could you, I mean, this is your mother. Like, how could you do this to your mother? And he almost sounds, like, remorseful when he thinks about it. He's like, I, you know, I was just so tired of us fighting and everything. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a lizard. I actually did come out of her and... It's, I'm like, well, how could you, after all that time, suddenly have remorse after doing something so vile to this body and his mother? Uh, it's just unbelievable. But anyways, so once he has done everything he's going to do with her body, including cutting out her tongue and larynx and trying to dispose of it in a garbage disposal, which doesn't work out, he puts her body in the closet. And he ends up going to a bar to get a drink. Again, it's like he's just so casual with this stuff. Which is mind-blowing. Like, how do you commit murder and then you're just, like, gonna go get a drink? Like, nothing happened. And, you know, he's still going to these bars where he's talking to these cops, like, and they're telling him all these details about, oh, yeah, you know, we got the what they're calling the co-ed killer. He's killed somebody else or like, this is what we're dealing with. And they're telling him all these details of these murders and he's just going along with it. I'm like, oh, that's crazy. I can only imagine the conversation. But so he goes to the bar, has a drink. And then he's like, I need to create a backstory for what happened to my mom. Like I need to figure out a way to get myself out of this. So he calls his mom's best friend. Her name is Sally. And he asks her to come over for, like, a movie night and for dinner. So, she does. And once she gets there, 
he strangles her to death and puts her body in the closet along with his mom's. And I actually think that he ends up leaving a note on the bodies. Um, and I didn't save that quote, but it's basically just saying, you know, that she's not suffering anymore or something like that. But anyway, so now he's like, okay, the, the story is going to be that they went off on vacation together. That's what he's thinking. They're going to think, but then he starts to kind of panic and he's like, they're going to be after me. So he takes off and he's got like a gun with him and like all kinds of bullets and everything. Cause he thinks there's going to be like a ton of cops after him. But after hours of just driving nonstop, he hasn't heard anything about it on the radio. And he's like realizing that nobody knows, nobody knows that he's already done this. So he stops to use a payphone and he calls the police himself. Because he, he just wants it to be over. And he talks to one of the police officers there. And he was like, hey, it's Ed Kemper, you know. And remember, they all know him. And he's He tells them, like, I just killed my mom and her friend. They don't believe him. Because they are so convinced that <laughs> Ed Kemper is such a great guy. That there's no way, no way that he would do that. This has got to be a prank call. And he's like, no, really, I did. And they just truly don't believe him. They end up hanging up. And he doesn't know what to do. So a few hours later, he just calls back. And he asks to talk to a different um, officer. Someone that he knows will take him seriously. Like like I said, he knows officers. So, And he tells him, like, hey, this is, it's me. I, I definitely did this. I can tell you all the details. You know, and they end up going and arresting him. And at that point he tells them like, yeah, I did do this. But he also admits to all the other, the other six murders of the young girls. So that's how they ended up catching him. He just, he turns himself in. And when they asked him, like, why did you just completely give up? You just like decided you didn't want to do this anymore. You just turned yourself in. And he says, well, you know, w the whole purpose was gone. Um, and I didn't see a reason for doing it anymore. It was just over. And so basically it was like his mom was his whole problem. And once he had killed her, that what was left to do? There was nothing left to do. And when asked about why he chose to kill those women, Apparently, like, where his mom worked at the college, she worked with these young girls, and she really thought highly of them. So, he feels like he's taking something that she loves away from her by killing these girls. Um, so, he goes to trial, and he tries to plead insanity. That's, like, that's the only thing that his attorney can try to get him off on. Because he is way too open. Like, he's so happy to share the details of everything that happened. So, there's no way that he just didn't do it. You know, you're not going to plead innocent. <laughs> so, his attorney pleads that he's not guilty by the reason of insanity. Um, and, of course, they go through the whole trial. They're trying to deem him insane. And it's just, it's not working. Because... Ed is so smart and he's so forthcoming with details that they are saying, like all the psychiatrists, three of them are like, he is totally sane. And supposedly um, they gave him like a truth serum at some point, which is kind of eh, controversial over whether it works or not. But supposedly under the truth serum, he says that not only did he kill them, but he also like ate the some skin of their legs or something like that but later he says that he didn't actually do that that he thought that by saying that that it would make his insanity plea more believable so he's characterized actually in some sources as a cannibal but he says that he definitely didn't do that he just said it for that particular reason in court that day um but anyway 
So after they find that he's definitely not crazy, he absolutely knew what he was doing. And they found him guilty on all counts. He has to be put to death. But more specifically, he has to be put to death by torture, not just like the electric chair or lethal injection. Like he wanted something specific. Which, I mean, that's like so medieval. And I, I don't know, like does he like, does that do something sexually for him? Like that's all I could think of. Um, but at the time, California had a prohibition on capital punishment. So they couldn't do that at all. Um, and it was only temporary. They, they brought it back. But at the time, they had a um, prohibition on it. So instead, he received seven years to life um, for each count. And those sentences were to be served concurrently at the California Medical facility. And he was actually housed in the same block as Charles Manson, who he actually, I think he says at one point that he really couldn't stand him. Um, but while he's in prison and he gets all these interviews, people always want to interview him because he's so willing to talk about his crime. He says that, you know, if you'll think back, think back to the beginning when I was telling you about how he was um, when he was in the, the prison as a juvenile and he would do all the tests on the new inmates. He said that he actually used that time to learn how to beat the tests so that he could fool his psychiatrists so that they wouldn't think that there was anything wrong with him. <clears throat> but he also used that time to learn from other criminals so he says that one um, person, one, one criminal that was in there for like sexual assault or something like that, this guy told him that if you ever rape a girl, you have to kill her. Because if you don't, she can, you know, she can identify you. <clears throat> and then you're, you know, you'll really be in trouble. <laughs> but he also said that whenever he was friends with the cops, like he was learning things from them too, you know, cause they're like, they're telling him all these details about the co killer, which as we know is him. And he's just learning what kind of information they have. And they never suspected a thing. They never suspected that it was him. So whenever he, um, and in addition to learning things that way, whenever he would pick up the first like 150 girls that he didn't hurt at all, that he just released, he said that he used that time to learn about his prey. And he just kind of figured out different ways to make these women comfortable with getting into the car with him. Because obviously they're going to be put off initially because he's a strange man. They don't know him. Um, so he needed to have a way to convince them that, yeah, like you can definitely get in the car with me. I'm safe. So one thing that he said he would do is if a girl was hesitating. So if he pulls over, he's like, hey, do you need a ride? And she's like, mm, I don't know, better not. He would say something like, um, like he would look down at his watch and be like, I'm sorry, I'm really in a hurry. Um, so do you need a ride or not? Like make her think that he has really something else to do so that she would feel like, Oh, there's, there's no way this guy's going to hurt me because he's got somewhere else to be. You know, he's got somewhere to be at a certain time. So he doesn't have time to hurt me. Um, let's see what happened after that. So he's housed in the same block as Charles Manson and he's given all these interviews and everything. And ever since then, he has been a completely model inmate. Um, they have given him, or they did give him, the task of scheduling inmate appointments. And he got really good at making ceramic cups. And he narrated like 50,000 books on tape for blind people. And the, the entire time, like any person that wanted to interview him, he would normally take the interview. And he would tell them all kinds of things. Any questions they had, he would answer. And it's almost like he did it just for... Like, the pleasure of it. And one psychiatrist even said that they don't think that he's crazy. They think that he, like, 
enjoys the um, attention. You know, that he turned himself, they think that he turned himself in because he wanted to be known as this killer. He wanted to kind of go down history as this killer. Which sounds really plausible, but on one hand, it's kind of like, I want, I want to think that he just wanted to keep society safe from him, but I'm not sure how true that is. So, Ed Kemper is actually still alive. Um, up until... 2015 he was still uh, scheduling appointments for other inmates but he ended up having a stroke in 2015 which left him medically disabled so he wasn't able to do any of his jobs quote unquote anymore so he they say that he retired from his jobs now, this is interesting, too. He's been up for parole quite a few times in the um, the 51 years now that he's been there. He'll be up for parole again on or in 2024, I think it is. Um, but half of the time that he has gone in for a parole hearing, he has asked to not go. Like, he has pushed it aside himself. Uh, one time he even said, like, the world just wasn't ready for him, and that was okay. Um, and he is perfectly content and happy where he is. He's totally happy being in jail, and he seems to fully intend to spend the rest of his days there. Which, honestly, he probably will. But as of right now... He is 72. Oh, I think he'll be 72 this year. And still in prison. And if you go online, you can find a current picture of him. Um, if you saw the our post about this, uh, then you would have seen his mugshot from when he was arrested in 73. And, uh, you know, one thing that I thought whenever I was... Um, researching about him. One thing that I was wondering about, like, what happened to his dad? Because it seems like he just kind of fell off the face of the earth. Like, obviously, he's upset. You know, I mean, Ed killed his parents. But, and you like, you don't really hear much about him. So, I found an article um, where they had interviewed Ed Kemper's half-brother. So, this was the son that his dad had with his new wife, his second wife. And he said that basically they just live in constant fear of the day that he gets released. Like even now, um, with Ed being 71, 72 years old, they still live in a state of constant fear because they believe that as soon as he gets out, he's going to come for them. And, Ed's dad really blames himself. He says that it was his fault. He should never have sent him to live with his parents. He should have taken care of him himself. And he he did pass away. Um, and only on his deathbed did he say that he does, that he ultimately is, he forgives Ed for what he did. And up until that point, he obviously held so much hate and resentment for what he did. I mean, wouldn't you? Like, I definitely would too. Um, but what else was I gonna? I was gonna add something to the end of that. I mean, he you know he was just set up to. He didn't have a good life. Not that that's a good reason. That's you you don't go around killing people, so it's not a good reason. But. He had such a horrible childhood. He didn't ever, he never learned how to interact with other people, how to have healthy relationships. So it, he didn't know how to do those things. Obviously, he was intelligent enough to know right from wrong. I mean, he, nobody has a IQ of 145 and not know right from wrong. But still, it was almost like he just never had a chance. But... Not that I'm justifying him, obviously. Like, definitely don't kill people. 
but yeah, so that's Ed Kemper. Ed Kemper's still alive. So who knows? Maybe he'll get paroled in 2024. Maybe we'll hear more about him. Hopefully not. <clears throat> okay, so um, I actually, I was going to finish painting this on live, but I'm almost done with it. I'm going to do a second coat on our colors. I'm going to color in the windows. Um, and then once I get this done, I'll post a picture of it. But other than that, we're, that'll be it. So if you enjoyed this episode today, I mean, I really enjoy it. I'm going to keep doing it. But if you really did like it, please share with other people that you think might like it. Um, and we're going to be doing this every Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. So we're doing themes. Saturday is coming up is going to be so, I'm so excited about it. It's going to be the Trans-Allegheny Insane Asylum. And I've already put out the template for that if you're interested. And all of our templates are going to be free. So you don't have to worry about ever paying for them. They're, this is just for fun. Like we're not making any money off of this at all. This is just kind of entertaining and something to do for the Halloween season, which we really, really love. And, um, so yeah, make sure you stay tuned. We, we do have a schedule that I think I'm just going to release the whole schedule at once so that, you know, if you know one specific thing that you're interested in, you can make sure to catch that. Um, but yeah, so I think that'll be it for tonight. Thanks so much guys for listening and share with your friends. Bye.